you can just say glia, okay? Either is fine. These are kind of supportive cells in a way. They surround neurons. They actually outnumber neurons by roughly about 50 to one. And they are much smaller than neurons. So these cells can divide by mitosis. They do divide throughout our lifetime. So again, when people have brain tumors, they are usually tumors of neuroglial cells, not neurons. And we'll talk about the types that are found in the CNS and the two types that are found in the PNS. Okay, so this is a diagram showing a cut through the brain and kind of blown up. <coughs> so you can see a couple of neurons here. Notice that these are multipolar neurons. And now notice all these other weird cells around them. These are all different types of neuroglial cells. Okay, so in the CNS, there are four neuroglial cells. So I would like you to know what they do and be able to identify these. Okay, you would be identifying these in, I think it's 14.7. And this is a table that puts them all together here with their functions for kind of a quick reference. But let's go through these and then we'll take a look at what they look like. Okay, so the most common neuroglial cells are called astrocytes. Astro means star-shaped. So they have a bunch of processes that stick out. These not only wrap around neurons to kind of help support the neurons, but they also wrap around capillaries. Capillaries are the tiniest <coughs> blood vessels in the body. Where they wrap around capillaries, they form an extra protective layer around the capillary, helping to prevent toxins that may be present in the blood from getting into the central nervous system. So they form what we call the blood-brain barrier, which is of course very important for protecting the brain and spinal cord from something that may have gotten into the blood. This also though prevents a lot of medications that can be used for different types of cancers and infections, things like that, from getting into the CNS. So it can make um, drug therapy very challenging for different conditions. These cells also form scar tissue if neurons are damaged, and they help to kind of control the electrolytes around the neurons. This is important because remember we said the action potential has to do with the movement of electrolytes or ions. So this, you know, kind of maintaining a normal balance of ions or electrolytes is really crucial for action potentials. So these cells have a lot of different functions. Okay, and this is what an astrocyte would look like. You can see its processes kind of helping to support this neuron, as well as kind of wrapping around the capillary wall, forming the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> okay, so another type of neuroglial cell in the CNS is called an ependymal cell. This is actually a type of epithelium. It is simple cuboidal with cilia. You guys know that epithelial tissues line cavities. We actually do have cavities in the brain. They are called ventricles. And we have a canal that runs down the spinal cord called the central canal. So this is the type of tissue that lines those areas. Also, these cells make cerebrospinal fluid, okay, CSF which we will be talking about more next week. And so for now, you can just kind of file this away for future reference. Each ventricle of the brain has an area that's called the choroid plexus, and that is where the cerebrospinal fluid is made. So these cells have an important role in making CSF in an area that's called the choroid plexus, okay? So taking a quick look, if this was, say, this could be a ventricle, it could be the central canal of the spinal cord, it's some space that's lined with the ependymal cells. These are the cilia here. And this would be our cerebrospinal fluid kind of flowing through this space. So as the cerebrospinal fluid is, is produced, it enters the ventricles and the central canal <coughs> and the cilia kind of move it along very slowly. 
So this helps to kind of move the CSF through those spaces. <coughs> okay, so a third type of neuroglial cell in the CNS is called microglia. These cells are phagocytic, meaning that they will take in and destroy foreign invaders. So these are like uh, macrophages that we talked about. <coughs> they are found in the brain and spinal cord. And this is kind of what a microglial cell would look like. These are supposed to be very small as far as cell size, so that's why it's called micro. <coughs> Notice in these neurons, it's showing you the nissel bodies that we talked about, also called chromatophilic substance, the rough and plasmic reticulum, and ribosomes. Okay, and then finally, the last type of neuroglial cell in the CNS, it's called an oligodendrocyte. Okay, oligodendrocytes have the function of forming a substance called myelin in the CNS. Myelin is really important. This is what electrically insulates the axons from each other so that you know, the action potential isn't automatically transmitted to all neurons all at once. They have an insulating layer around them. But also, this will affect the action potential. So we'll talk more about myelin. This is also what gives us white matter. What we call white matter is really myelinated axons. It's the axons that have this kind of coating around them. This is also what degenerates in the disease um, multiple scler sclerosis. People who have MS have different sensory and motor symptoms depending on what neurons are involved. But it is caused by the breakdown of the myelin sheath, and that will affect the action potential. Okay, so this is an oligodendrocyte. This is a cell body here. Notice these cells have these processes that reach out, and they wrap around axons. So we have a bunch of axons that are passing by, and so this one oligodendrocyte is forming parts of the myelin sheath on these different axons. So it's literally kind of wrapping its membrane around the axons so that the axon is insulated. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Okay, so those are the neuroglial cells in the CNS. You guys have these pictures of each of these in figure 4.7. Okay, so this is a, these are diagrams that will be on the practical exam. I'd like you to be able to identify these cells and know what their basic functions are. Okay, so two types of neuroglial cells in the PNS. Satellite cells are located around sensory neuron cell bodies. Okay, and a ganglion is just a grouping of neuron cell bodies. And We'll talk more about this, but you will see that whether we're talking about the central nervous system or the peripheral, neurons are organized so that their cell bodies are located together and their axons travel together, right? Which makes sense. They're not gonna be just all scrambled up, just you know, like a big mess. They're gonna be organized. So a group of neuron cell bodies out in the PNS is called a ganglion. Ganglion is Singular ganglia is plural. And we'll see that these satellite cells kind of protect the neuron cell bodies as well as providing nutrients to them. And so this is a bunch of neuron cell bodies. Okay, the things are shown in yellow. <coughs> Notice these are unipolar neurons, right? The one process attached to the cell body. And you can see these little pink cells that are around the neuron cell bodies are the satellite cells, kind of protecting those cell bodies. This whole structure here, this kind of like bundle of neuron cell bodies is the ganglion. Okay, this whole grouping of cell bodies is a ganglion. Okay, so one more type of neuroglial cell, and that is the neurolimocyte. These are also called Schwann cells. 
I think it's easier just to say Schwann cell, but you can call them either one. Okay, these are the cells that form myelin in the PNS. So same substance, it electrically insulates the axons, it will affect how the action potential travels, but these form myelin in the PNS, the oligodendrocytes form it in the CNS. Okay, so what does this look like? This is what looks like kind of like the hot dog buns wrapped around the axon, okay? So this is what is called the myelin sheath. This axon is a myelinated axon, okay? It's a myelinated axon. Now, we saw that in the CNS, an oligodendrocyte, um, excuse me, has these processes that reach out and wrap around the axons. Notice that these cells look different. Each Schwann cell kind of wraps itself around the axon. So this is one Schwann cell, this is another Schwann cell, that's another one, that's another one. But the myelin sheath looks basically the same, okay? It's basically the same, it's just the cells go about it in a, in a different way. <coughs> okay, and this shows a comparison here. Again, these would be the oligodendrocytes in the CNS, and these are Schwann cells or neurolimocytes in the PNS. But notice that the myelinated axons look basically the same. So how does this process work? Uh -huh. uh, two things. What is the neural cycle in the unit? And then um, the, it, are they all the same instance like that? Because maybe in the CNS cells there's more connections or does it help connections at all? Do the oligodendrocytes so make? I would think like CNS and NS, they are more directly with the But like the, <coughs> once you get to the, the brain, isn't the same thing also for example? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the brain, because there's so many axons traveling kind of in different directions or close together, I think it, it kind of makes sense for the oligodendrocytes to have this kind of um, structure and for them to just kind of have these processes that reach out and wrap around axons that are all around them. This probably also helps to some degree to kind of hold on to the axons for support. Where in the PNS, all of the axons are wrapped up in a nerve, so they don't really need that structural support. I think that's why there is that difference, or that could be one, one reason. Um, and the neurofibril node that you were asking about is where the axon is bare. So where you see these little sections of yellow, that would be like the naked axon. Okay, in between the areas of the myelin sheath. And actually, that's a good question because we're gonna be talking about <clears throat> the neurofibril nodes. These are also called nodes of Ranvier. And this is someone's name, it's a French name. So pronounce it Ranvier, like Perrier. <clears throat> or you can say neurofibril node, either one is fine. But these are important because this is the only place that the action potential is transmitted in a myelinated axon. So let's take a look here. This is just showing how the myelin sheath is formed. So here we have a little piece of axon, and this is a Schwann cell or neurolimocyte, and it's just showing you kind of how this would wrap around the axon to form the myelin sheath. So notice that it starts to kind of wrap around the axon, and it's going to continue wrapping around it. And you can see here, more and more and more of its membrane is wrapping around the axon. So this is going to really insulate that axon so that you know the action potential cannot go through here, right? The ions cannot cross over the cell membrane of the axon. So this prevents the action potential from traveling through that part of the axon. Okay, and also you see there's these kind of different parts of the Schwann cell here. So where the membrane is wrapping around the axon a bunch of times, that is the actual myelin sheath. Okay, so right here, that is the myelin sheath. 
right, where the membrane is wrapped around the axon. Anything that's left over outside of that, where we'd have some leftover cytoplasm of the Schwann cell along with its nucleus, that is called the neurolemma. Okay, and although your book doesn't label it here, it talks about it. And this is a structure on your list, so I would like you guys to know that. So when you see, and this is just a little further along in the process, when you see the uh, nucleus of the Schwann cell kind of outside of the myelin sheath, so again, this is the myelin sheath here, that is called the neurolemma. So that would be this part out here. There, it's, it's both part of the Schwann cell, okay? So the myelin sheath and the neurolemma are both formed by the Schwann cell. It's just these you know, two different parts of it. And who had the question? Uh-huh. Uh, what is the myelin mean? I'm sorry, what's the what? Like L-E-M-M-A or O. Oh, lemma? means membrane. Like plasma lemma is another name for the cell membrane. Yeah, and sarcolemma, it's another name for membrane. I believe the axon's membrane is called the axolemma. Okay, so let's take a look at a diagram one more time of a myelinated axon and try to kind of just understand how the action potential would travel down that axon. If the myelin sheath prevents the action potential from going along here, then how does that electrical current go down a myelinated axon? And we'll come back to this. Okay, I think we have to actually go back to, let's go back to this diagram here. Okay, so this is a myelinated axon, right? And we said that all of these areas where it is myelinated, that would prevent the action potential from traveling through here. So instead, what happens is the action potential is usually going to begin here. What do we call this part of the axon? The axon hillock, exactly. So it's going to start here. It will actually be transmitted from here it will go to that next neurofibril node or node of Ranvier. So from here, it will kind of skip over this area of myelination. From here, it's going to skip to here, to this next node. So in a way, it's like it's skipping down the axon. This will actually cause the action potential to travel much, much faster because it doesn't have to be transmitted the whole length of the axon. Instead, it's just going to kind of go and it will get to the end of the axon very fast. So in a myelinated axon, the action potential travels roughly 100 meters per second. So very, very fast, right? 100 meters per second. Compared to an unmyelinated axon, it would travel about a meter per second. So it's still fast and we do have some unmyelinated axons in the body, but most of our axons are myelinated, and it travels much, much faster in a myelinated axon. We call this type of conduction saltatory. Saltera means to jump, so this kind of jumping conduction is called saltatory conduction. Okay, and so that is what you see here. So saltatory conduction is the one that's really fast that happens in a myelinated axon versus an unmyelinated, where again, the action potential travels the entire length of the axon. This is called continuous. You can think of it as being you know, not interrupted. And so this would take place in unmyelinated axons. So for now, this is the only thing you guys need to know about the action potential. You will talk more about it when you take physiology, okay? But I do want you to know about the two different types of conduction in myelinated versus unmyelinated axons, okay? And that is in chapter 14. Um, 
plexus, but does plexus mean a network of nerves or? A plexus, yes. So a plexus is a network of nerves where sometimes out in different areas in the body, um, actually it's pretty common for nerves to kind of come together and they often will literally kind of unravel, um, kind of reorganizing their axons and then sending you know, those axons into different tissues. We will talk about some plexuses, but plexus just means network. You guys have any other questions on any of this before we talk about one more thing? Mm -hmm. So like for like the brachial plexus, is that like your arms? Yes. So the brachial plexus is where the spinal nerves, um, as they exit the spinal cord, they literally will kind of unravel, reorganizing themselves to form new nerves that will go into the upper extremity. And so it's called brachial because the nerve supplied the upper extremity. Okay, guys, so one more thing that's in chapter 14 is the structure of a nerve. So let's go ahead and talk about this. This is actually very simple, kind of similar to the layers of connective tissue that we see in the muscle, right? Do these names look kind of familiar? Except they were called epimyceum, perimyceum, endomyceum. It's actually very much the same. Okay, so a nerve is a bundle of axons. It's a bundle of axons traveling together in the peripheral nervous system. That's all it is. It's kind of a grouping of axons. They're held together with these layers of connective tissue. The interesting thing about a nerve is that they can contain different types of neurons. So within the same nerve, we can have sensory neurons and motor neurons traveling right next to each other, but the action potentials are traveling in different directions, right? So nerves can be either entirely sensory, meaning all the neurons in that nerve are sensory neurons. They can be entirely motor, meaning all the neurons are motor neurons in that nerve, or they can be what we call mixed. This is actually the most common type of nerve in the body. Most of our nerves are mixed, meaning they carry both sensory and motor neurons. Okay, so let's take a look at a diagram that shows these layers of connective tissue. And I think this is figure 14.12. This will also be on the practical exam. Okay, so this is a cross-section through a nerve, a cut through a nerve, and you can see here surrounding the entire thing, notice that the outermost layer of connective tissue here is the epineurium, epi meaning outside of or on top of. This is dense irregular, just like epimyceum. And then you can see here how the axons are bundled into these little bundles. These little bundles are called <coughs> fascicles, just like in the muscle, right? So a bundle of axons is a fascicle, and fascicles are surrounded by another layer of this connective tissue, which is called perineurium, right? Just like in the muscle, except in the muscle, it was, of course, perimyceum. Okay, so perineurium, surrounds fascicles. This is also dense irregular. Okay, and then finally notice there is, they're showing one axon sticking out. This happens to be a myelinated axon, so you can see they're showing the myelin sheath here. And um, this is the endoneurium the layer of connective tissue that surrounds each individual axon, okay? And this would be areolar tissue, a little more delicate, just like endomyceum. Okay, and you can see that the nerve will usually have its own blood supply. Sometimes you'll see some adipose tissue in here between the fascicles. 
They can actually be very large. Like the largest nerve in the, bio the body, the sciatic nerve, is about um, a half inch in diameter. So they, they can be pretty large, carry a bunch of axons. This is a photograph of a section through a nerve. This is not really very clear, but this is one of the slides I want you guys to look at. So we'll talk more about this slide on Tuesday, okay? This isn't from an electron microscope. This would be a different type of cut. This is a longitudinal section, like we're looking at it long ways. This is a cross section, like we're looking at the, the cut ends of um, each individual axon and that connective tissue around them is the endoneurium. Around each fascicle would be perineurium. Mm -hmm. And then if you could see the outer layer, it would be the epineurium. Okay, and that is it for chapter 14. Do you guys have any other questions you can think of right now? <coughs>